When I was around 12 years old, I spent the afternoon at a friend's house who I knew from school. He lived in a neighborhood that I wasn't all that familiar with, so when we decided to take our bikes out for a ride, I simply followed him until we came to a large wooded area. It was in a valley that descended away from the roadside, and from what I could see became rather dense and overgrown quite quickly. Because of all the foliage, we decided to leave our bikes and go down on foot. We had been hiking for about 20 minutes when we realized that we could no longer see the spot that we had left our bikes and were surrounded on all sides by thick vegetation. Being boys, we thought this was absolutely fantastic and decided to carry on further into the valley. At some point we came across what looked like an abandoned campsite. There were some old cans lying around that looked like they had been used to boil water, an old ashy fire pit, and quite a lot of plastic sheeting. We had a look around but didn't really find anything interesting, so decided to carry on with our hike. Just as we were leaving, somebody called out to us from somewhere on the other side of the camp. A homeless man appeared, no doubt the camp dweller, and demanded to know what we were doing with his things. We explained that we didn't take anything, and were just looking around, and he calmed down. We made a polite conversation for a few minutes, exchanged names and gave a vague idea of where we had come from. At this point, we didn't feel like we were in any danger and the homeless guy was actually quite friendly. We decided to get going though, and said our goodbyes, but he told us that we had to give him something before we went. We hadn't brought any food or water with us, and so didn't have anything to offer him, and he apparently took exception to this. He started yelling at us and demanded our shoes, which neither of us were willing to part with. We started to back away from him, and at the same time try and figure out which way we had come from when all of a sudden he pulled a knife out and started running towards us. I don't remember exactly which way we went or how far we had run as I was terrified and full of adrenaline. I look back a few times and realize that we were getting away from him but he was still chasing us even though there was no cover from the trees at this point. We reached the side of the road where we had left our bikes and fortunately had enough of a lead on him so that we could hop on and pedal for all we were worth. A couple of builders who were offloading materials up the road saw that we were panicked and stopped us to find out what was going on. We gave them a brief version of events and they went back to see if he was still around, but apparently he was gone when they got there. My friend told his folks what happened that day, but I never heard anything more about it. As far as I know, he could still be living at his campsite, but I certainly wasn't going to go back and check. Little bit of a background. I'm a 22-year-old female, and I just moved to a small town from a big city with my dad. We moved into our house in early October 2015, and we were having problems with a leaky shower in the bathroom adjacent to mine, so my dad called a plumber to come take a look. The plumber arrived around 8 a.m. the following day while I was getting ready for work in my bathroom. My dad let him in, so I hadn't gotten a good look at him. My dad then apparently goes down the street to gas up his car and then go to work, leaving the plumber to do his damn job in the bathroom. Now, my bathroom is just a toilet and vanity, with a door leading into a shared shower room that has another door leading into my dad's bathroom. So, while I was getting ready, there was only a door between the plumber and I. I guess he figured out that there was a lady in the house due to my hair dryer. Next thing I know, 
my bedroom door is opening and closing, and there is a very tall, very wide, very terrifying man with more legs than teeth locking my door from the inside behind him. He then walks five feet towards me and stops in front of my bathroom door. I freeze. He stands there staring at me for the longest 30 seconds of my life. He hits me with the widest, untoothiest grin and literally looks me up and down multiple times. I hear the front door open and close, not knowing then that my dad had forgotten his wallet, and the plumber pivots on one foot in a twirly motion and unlocks my door and walks out. My dad runs in my room asking if that guy had really just been there and goes to run after him, but the guy walked right to his truck and left without fixing our shower. So... My dad immediately calls the company we hire the plumber from and asks them to send someone else but not that guy and he tries to explain what happened to the manager. The manager proceeds to tell my dad that it was our fault that the man locked himself in my room with me because I didn't lock him out of my room in the first place. Sorry, didn't know when I needed to lock myself away in order not to be creeped on by a supposed professional. Just terrifying to think of what would have happened if my dad didn't forget his wallet. Spring 2014 is a slow season for my father's business. The weather is nice and the roads are clear, which means slow shifts at an auto shop. It was mid-April, around 4 p.m., the wind was pulling in a nice spring breeze when my dad, Bill, was walking along the side of his shop. It happened to overlook a small stream and running trail, which he enjoyed gazing at near the end of his shift. The side of his building ran along the top of a steep hill, which turned into the path. He heard a ruffling in the wind, and about halfway down the hill, he sees a big blue tarp. Being very proud of his business and its appearance, he started to climb down the hill. He was just about to grab for it, about 15 feet away, to toss it in the dump, when he saw a car pull into the lot. He turned around and went to help his customer. When 5.30pm rolls around, he closes up and goes home, forgetting about the tarp. The next afternoon, Bill is sitting in his office when three policemen came in. They asked my father and co-workers a bunch of questions about any suspicious behavior they may have seen. Now on a side note, my dad is extremely charismatic and friendly. He oftentimes talks people into sharing information with him that they really shouldn't. He looks like someone you can trust, and you can and he seemed to always have the insider details about things like this. He used his humor to make people feel comfortable, which helped getting strangers to open up to him. So Bill and his co-worker Hank are talking with a female police officer when she lets it slip that a body had been discovered just down the hill. Oh shit, I was down there yesterday cleaning. I didn't see any body though. Bill said. Around what time? Did you happen to see a large blue and white tarp while you were cleaning the area? She asked intensely. Uh, actually, yeah. I almost grabbed it yesterday, but I ended up getting distracted. She asked him more questions about what time, what he saw, etc. When he asked her if the body was found in the tarp. Uh, Yes, it was. A woman jogging found it this morning around 10.30 a.m. My dad was floored. He was just there yesterday. After a few more questions, the police all head to the crime scene to finish the initial investigation. No one was allowed on the scene, and the police were asking that passerby not take any photos. Luckily for you guys... My dad took one from his office window. 
This is what it looked like. You can see near the top of the picture the running trail. Just in front of that is part of the creek that has dried up. There are the officers and such searching for whatever they were searching for. You can also see just left of the officer in black a teeny shade of blue. That would be the tarp. Flash forward a few days. The police went back to my father's shop. They noticed a security camera set up around the building and they were hoping that they might catch something on tape. While transferring the data over, my dad started asking more questions about the murder. He learned it was a middle-aged man that had been stabbed to death. Not too much to go on, as it seemed. Hey, you know, there's a couple of meth heads that live in that shack behind our shop. It's connected to that bar? Bill started talking about his own predictions for the whodunit scenarios. He continued, Yeah, we have a lot of problems with them. Stealing scrap metal from the back, letting their dogs run wild, even had them threaten to shoot me once when I was spraying their dogs with water to quit the barking. You should check them out. The officer nodded, gathered the rest of his things, and left. Hey, Hank, let's go down there, see if we can find anything cool. My father whispered to his co-worker. Mm-hmm. All right. I guess I couldn't do any harm. Uh, <clears throat> all right. I guess I couldn't do any harm. Hank replied hesitantly. They started down the hill where the trench was found. The grass was flat and the tarp was now gone. They'd walked around for 15 or so minutes when Bill headed up the stream a little ways. The trail runs under a main road and then leads to a man-made lake. Just under the bridge, the water starts to get heavier and the trees are a bit thicker. He noticed a red Lowe's cart into one of the trees. I'm taking that for the shop, he thought, as he ran over to pull it out of the stream. Calling over to Hank for help, the two of them pull it out and start wheeling it back up the hill. Suddenly, my dad stops. He sees something on the cart. What is that rusty stuff? Hank, stop. Look at that fucking cart. Is that blood? They look closer, and sure enough, blood. It was all over the cart, on the handle, on the wheels, inside. But it wasn't only blood they started to notice. Hair. Human hair. Utterly stunned, my dad calls the policewoman he had been talking to the previous days and explained what they found. For whatever reason, the PD was very skeptical that this was evidence. At first they didn't even believe my father. When he told them that it made no sense to make up, they sent out a car. There were two police officers and a CSI. The CSI asked my dad why he thought this was blood. Uh, it looks like blood, sir. Mm, I'm not sure. How do you know that is human hair? The CSI asked. Because it looks like human hair. My dad snapped sarcastically. Why did he seem so hesitant? They used a chemical test and sure enough, it tested positive for human blood. They took the card as evidence and thanked my dad. Again, my dad tried to give his opinion on who the mystery killer might be. He suggested again that they talk with the crazy neighbors behind his auto shop. Still no information was taken down and they left with what they had. Two more days pass. My dad is leaving the shop to get some things from Costco. There is a small dirt alley that leads to the main road, just behind his work. In the past, it had been blocked by one of the meth addicts' car. They were complaining to my dad and his boss about the business driving cars back and forth through the alley, disrupting them. He notices it's open and decides to take the shortcut to its destination. 
but something was off. He saw the usual blocked car sitting in front of the shack. The door was wide open and there was someone sitting on their knees with their upper body inside the car. He got in his car and crept up, just a little, so he could see what was happening. He right away recognized the skinny red-headed woman as the female that lived in the shack. It was the shack's guy's wife or girlfriend. He didn't know exactly. She was on her hands and knees surrounded with hard chemicals. Bleach, Comet, OxyClean and much more. My dad had said that he knew right then that they were guilty. For one, why would someone be scrubbing their car with straight chemicals? No water, no rinsing. It was the middle of the day on a hot, hot June afternoon. Second, they happened to be only two blocks away from a local car wash. He said it felt off and he knew to trust his instincts. She just kept scrubbing and scrubbing the passenger side floor. He pulled out his phone and started recording her. Now, he's known this woman and her significant other for a few years now. Like I said, they complained about my father's workers and he complained about their dogs on and off for a while. It was all harmless bickering. My dad, always trying to be the funny guy, yells out his window as he's driving past. Covering up a murder. He laughed and drove away, hearing her say fuck you as he drove off. This time when he called the police, they took it very seriously. He explained that she was cleaning the car aggressively and that it seemed like she was trying to bleach something out of the car. The next day, the PD went by to talk with the residents of the shack. The day after that, they made an arrest. After searching the shack, they found a large blood stain soaked into the plywood floor. Once the blood was seen, the wife-girlfriend crumbled and told the police everything. It was her, her husband, boyfriend, and the victim. The victim was named Rich. He had gone over to their little house to shoot up and get high. Someone ended up accusing Rich of putting some of the dope aside for himself, and things got heated. Eventually, the husband started to physically fight with Rich when he stabbed him. He bled out on the floor and died. They didn't know what to do, so they stole the Lowe's cart to move him around, loaded him into the car, wrapped him in the tarp, and pushed his body down the hill. They ditched the cart, thinking the river would wash it down far enough that it wouldn't be found. My dad and Hank sat in their car while they watched the police arrest Don, the suspected murderer. He took a video of that as well. You can hear my dad very inappropriately yelling out his window, Ha ha, killer, in the video. Both were videos lost when he switched phones. Now my dad says that he's going to start a P.I. business because he solved a murder all on his own. This all happened about a year ago. After two months of being married to my husband, I became pregnant with our daughter. We were more shocked than happy. We were only 22 years old and we were wanting to put building a family on hold for a couple of years while adjusted to married life. I was stressed out most of the time and worried about everything related and not related to the pregnancy. My husband called me paranoid and a worry wart. I was about four months pregnant when I started to believe that I was being watched by someone. I would see a white 2006 Impala drive by my house at least once a week as I was leaving for work and following me there. I told my husband and he laughed me off, calling me paranoid it was just pregnancy hormones. I thought maybe I was just being a little paranoid and left it at that. One day, 
I was at the supermarket, and there was this middle-aged man just staring at me and followed me through the store at a distance. I told myself I was probably overthinking things and went to the checkout. The man left the store and I dropped my suspicions. As I walked out to my car, I noticed the white Impala that I had previously mentioned in the supermarket parking lot, but it could have been anybody's. I started driving home, and just a few miles away from the store, the Impala came up behind me and followed me until I came to my house, and he drove on, and I didn't even see that car for two weeks after. My husband and I were in bed and I couldn't sleep, so I got up to walk around the house and get some water. I was at the sink getting water from the tap, and I happened to look out the window and saw the outline of someone. I froze, thinking my eyes were playing tricks on me and the figure ran off. I screamed for my husband, and he came bursting out of our room, buck naked, bless his heart, and asked me what's wrong. I told him what had happened. He didn't believe I saw someone. He blamed it on the hormones again, and I was furious and started yelling at him and crying. He told me that I should talk to someone because it could be stress-induced whatever is causing me to see things and be so paranoid, and that he told my mom and his about what I was going through, and they thought I had been acting off as well and told him to have me talk to my doctor. I agreed to call my doctor only because I was very stressed out, not because I thought it was paranoia causing me to see someone and think I'm in danger. I talked to my family doctor the following week, and she told me that it sounded like pregnancy-induced anxiety along with depression, and told me that she suggested I get on medication for that immediately because it can get worse. That upset me a lot because I knew that it wasn't just hormones making me feel this way. Someone was actually following me. Things were pretty calm for a month after that. My husband was working late one night and I was in the kitchen cleaning up and the security system started going off and moments later I got a phone call from the police station and asked them to come out immediately and phone my husband after who left work early to come home after hearing what happened. The police checked to find the entrance that the alarm was set off and it was the sliding door in the living room. The frame was busted. I told the cops about the previous incidents involving a man in a white Impala that were following me and told them I thought it was the same person. My husband apologized to me for not believing me. After that, I didn't feel safe there anymore, so my husband and I moved closer to my parents about an hour away. Nothing has happened yet, and crossing my fingers that nothing will. Hey everybody, thanks for watching, and very special thank you to Creepy Mrs. Pasta for assisting me with narrating today's stories. Be sure to subscribe to our page by clicking on the on-screen link or in the description and comments below. I'm sure she'd appreciate it. If you got a scary story or experience you'd like to hear narrated on Let's Read, be sure to send it to the email in the description, and you might just see it in the next video. That'd be awesome. Have an amazing week, everyone, and as always, I'll see you again soon. Bikes, and we're surrounded on all sides by thick vegetation. Being boys, we thought this was absolutely fantastic and decided to carry on further into the valley. At some point, we came across what looked like an abandoned campsite. There were some old cans lying around that looked like they had been used to boil water, an old ashy fire pit, and quite a lot of plastic sheeting. We had a look around but didn't really find anything interesting, so decided to carry on with our hike. Just as we were leaving, somebody called out to us from somewhere on the other side of the camp. A homeless man appeared, no doubt.
When I was around 12 years old, I spent the afternoon at a friend's house who I knew from school. He lived in a neighborhood that I wasn't all that familiar with, so when we decided to take our bikes out for a ride, I simply followed him until we came to a large wooded area. It was in a valley that descended away from the roadside, and from what I could see became rather dense and overgrown quite quickly. Because of all the foliage, we decided to leave our bikes and go down on foot. We had been hiking for about 20 minutes when we realized that we could no longer see the spot that we had left our butt him so that we could hop on and pedal for all we were worth. A couple of builders who were offloading materials up the road saw that we were panicked and stopped us to find out what was going on. We gave them a brief version of events and they went back to see if he was still around, but apparently he was gone when they got there. My friend told his folks what happened that day, but I never heard anything more about it. As far as I know, he could still be living at his campsite, but I certainly wasn't going to go back and check. the camp dweller and demanded to know what we were doing with his things. We explained that we didn't take anything and were just looking around, and he calmed down. We made a polite conversation for a few minutes, exchanged names and gave a vague idea of where we had come from. At this point, we didn't feel like we were in any danger, and the homeless guy was actually quite friendly. We decided to get going though, and said our goodbyes, but he told us that we had to give him something before we went. We hadn't brought any food or water with us, and so didn't have anything to offer him, and he apparently took exception to this. He started yelling at us and demanded our shoes which neither of us were willing to part with. We started to back away from him and at the same time try and figure out which way we had come from when all of a sudden he pulled a knife out and started running towards us. I don't remember exactly which way we went or how far we had run as I was terrified and full of adrenaline. I look back a few times and realize that we were getting away from him but he was still chasing us even though there was no cover from the trees at this point. We reached the side of the road where we had left our bikes and fortunately had enough of a lead 